You probably know this feeling. You transcribe the lick and you want to use it because it sounds amazing on the album that you're listening to. Now you learn to play it, but every time you try to use it in a solo, then it doesn't sit right with the rest of the stuff you're playing and breaks up everything and really ruins your solo. In this video, I'm going to talk about how you avoid that problem. And I'm also going to show you how you expand your vocabulary with short phrases that are much more flexible and that sound like jazz, but certainly also sound like you. My name is Jens Larsen, learn jazz, make music. The phrases that you get the most out of in your playing are probably quite short. So between four and eight notes. And that's because if you're learning a phrase or a lick that's several bars, then that's just gonna be too long to be really flexible and you can't really mold it and make it your own in that way. So it's always going to sound like you're copy pasting a line from somebody else into your solo. So it makes sense that you wanna focus more on working on shorter building blocks and then work on putting those together in a way that's much more effective and also really helping you shape your sound. A great example of somebody who plays like this and also does it extremely well is Joe Pass. And you can find some examples of this demonstrated in his book, Joe Pass Guitar Style. Let's first look at some of those shorter building blocks and phrases and then talk about how to deal with longer phrases. If you check out the first blues example in this book, which is a solo on a blues in C, then you'll see that Joe Pass is very often splitting the bar in two. So we have a first half, which is actually quite often some sort of chromatic enclosure, and then a second half, which is more often like a scale run or an arpeggio. An example of this could be bar four, which is essentially just a bar of C7, uh, but you can also analyze it as they do in the book as G minor seven, C7. So we start on the B flat, then we get a phrase that's really just a chromatic enclosure going towards the G, so like this. And then from the G, we get a descending C7 arpeggio. And then that's resolving to F7. Besides giving you a lot of really great phrases, then this book is also a great example of how you want to make lines that really point toward the next chord or the next bar all the time. That's really what's happening. There's a lot of forward drive in these lines and that's something that you also want to have in your own lines. So really think about how you really have this movement going to this one then really going to this. So you're always driving forward and always pushing towards the next heavy beat which is of course one and uh, three. You should really consider checking out this Joe Pass book. It is really worthwhile and it's a great place to study some really solid jazz vocabulary and also hear how it's really used in a musical way. Uh, besides that, it's also really good for your reading because there are no tabs in there. Uh, I was actually thinking about making a series of videos where I'm talking about different books, but not only about what's good about the books or what the or bad uh, for that matter, but also about how they teach and what they're focusing on. But uh, we'll see if I get around to doing that. And you can really benefit from studying the solos like this and analyzing what are the building blocks. For that, it actually makes sense to also look at what are the different types of building blocks. Let's do that next. Let's use this Joe Pass chorus to just define a few different types of building blocks that we have available because actually it has a lot of different things in there. In the D minor seven bar, we have some Coltrane patterns. So the bar sounds like this. And actually that's first an F major Coltrane pattern, so. And then a descending A minor Coltrane pattern. There's also a scale run in the next bar. So that's really just, of course, also a possibility that you just have a melody that's just a scale run. Actually, if you check out a lot of standard melodies, a lot of any type of melodies, you'll find scale runs. That's also a strong melody. That's of course also a building block. One of the things that's really great about these Joe Pass choruses is how he uses chromatic enclosures. An example of that is in bar three, like this. And I think that's one of the main things you want to learn from playing and studying these courses, the ability to use chromatic enclosures and chromatic phrasing like this in a jazz way. And of course, you also have some great examples of how you can use arpeggios, even if Joe Pass sometimes insists that he doesn't really use arpeggios. Now, it's not that it's not done or it's not good, it's just that I don't do it. In the last bar of the chorus on the D minor seven, we have a D minor seven arpeggio. <laughs> In fact, it's probably a D minor nine arpeggio. 
it continues up to the E on the G7. Of course, there are many different types of phrases and these four are not covering everything and there are also no strict names for them. You really just have to organize that for yourself, I think. And that's probably gonna be better also because you're probably going to be more inclined to use certain types of building blocks because of your taste. And that's what's making you sound like you, that's just fine. But it is worthwhile just thinking about the different building blocks that are used and understanding how melodies are constructed because that's gonna help you play better lines and come up with better lines yourself. If you think about these small fragments as building blocks, then you can start constructing your own 251 licks like this. So here I'm first using a Coltrane pattern, a D minor Coltrane pattern, then a G minor seven arpeggio, then a C seven arpeggio, so, and then a chromatic enclosure, resolving to the A. And that's of course just using really four note blocks most of the time, so that's a four note block, the G minor seven arpeggio, and then also trying to lead into the next one, so this is ending on an F, taking me to the E where I play the next one and then also resolving, really just making it a smooth transition from C7 to F major seven. Another example could sound something like this. So here I'm starting with a chromatic enclosure, really targeting the B flat, so the third of the chord. Then from here we have uh, the arpeggio from the third of the chord, so B flat major seven. And then on the C7, this of course just takes us down to the G quite naturally, and then here, also a picture from the third, but then from the third in F harmonic minor, so we get a flat nine. And then another chromatic phrase, resolving to the third of A, uh, sorry, the third of F major A. Of course, when you're working like this, then everything you play is extremely clear. You're really connecting with the harmony and you're really spelling out the changes, but that's also a drawback because not all jazz music is that clear and not everything is supposed to just really sit on the heavy beats all the time. So that's what we're gonna discuss next. This is an example from the video that I did on why you should study bebop. And I think when you look at this, you can clearly see that it's really constructed from building blocks. So you first get a minor triad, then the A minor major arpeggio, and then a chromatic enclosure, and then just a short D7 altered scale run to resolve down to G major seven. So in that way, it's really put together from building blocks, but there's also something else connecting them because you also still have the sort of voice leading thing happening within there. That does mean that you wanna work on not only connecting building blocks, but also seeing how you can connect them and having sort of a larger idea happening. This is something that you also can analyze when you're analyzing licks, then look at what is the longer idea. Don't look at the specific notes, but look at sort of the bigger picture and try to figure out what that idea is and see if you can use that using different building blocks that you already know. This solo example is from a Kurt Rosenwinkel solo on I Remember April. It's in fact also one I did a video on, so I'll link to that in the description. I think it's quite clear what the building blocks are because first we get a C major seven arpeggio on the A minor, then we get a descending F minor triad, which you can call a lot of things. It could be an E7, it could be a side slip to a B flat minor. And then we get the E minor triad. And then we get this phrase, which is kind of like a D major triad and then an E flat minor triad, which is of course also just D7 altered, resolving to the A on the G major seven. The thing that's interesting here is that he's not really sticking to emphasizing one and three and sort of keeping it clear in the beat or in the groove in that way. He's moving on top of it and he's using a lot of uh, three note groupings. So of course we first get, this is a four note grouping, but then we get some three note groupings. before he resolves. So in that way, he's kind of making a little bit vague where the bar line is, and in that way being a lot more open sounding and a lot more free on top of the meter. Not always playing your lines so that they fall on the heavy beat is actually a part of jazz tradition. We don't always play that square, and this is something that you don't only find with more modern people like Kurt Rosenwinkel. If you check out Charlie Parker or Sonny Rollins, then you're gonna find numerous examples of this as well. Here's a really famous example from Parker. 
So here he starts off with just a G minor seven arpeggio and also really targeting the three. But then we get this moving pattern that's three notes. So he's really, really playing a pattern that doesn't sit in the meter at all and is kind of suggesting another meter, namely three, four. So we get first this three, three note pattern, then, then this, and then finally this one. And this is quite typical for Parker. He will play a lot of phrases that actually rhythmically are quite free, that like this suggest another meter, or maybe he will suspend the resolution of a dominant till in the middle of the bar, and in that way create some extra tension. It's a part of jazz tradition, it's a part of the language, and it's also something you wanna to try to incorporate besides being able to spell out the changes. As you can probably tell from analyzing all the phrases in this video, then one of the most powerful building blocks that we have is arpeggios. And if you want to check out some more options when it comes to having more arpeggios in your vocabulary, then check out this video where I'm going over 25 different arpeggios that all sound great on a D minor seven chord.